The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start talking about the development of atomic theory. I'm going to uh, whiz through what the evidence is for the existence of atoms. And then we're going to talk about how the atom is not the most basic constituent of matter, how the atom can be divided into at least an electron and a nucleus. And then what we're going to see is how the existing classical way of thinking, Newtonian mechanics, cannot explain how that electron and that nucleus hangs together. And later on in the course, we're going to see how that existing classical physics is not going to be able to explain how two atoms hang together. All right, we're going to look at the fundamental principles here of chemical bonding. All right, so I'm going to get going on this subject. And then about three quarters of the way through, I'm going to stop. And then I'll do some introductions of our teaching team this semester. And then um, also we'll talk about the mechanics of the course and some expectations uh, of the course. All right. All right. Um, so uh, let's get going. Uh, certainly the ancient Greeks were uh, known to have uh, pondered whether matter uh, can be divided uh, ad infinitum into smaller and smaller pieces, chopped up into smaller and smaller pieces or whether there was a point at which you couldn't chop up matter any further. Well, Aristotle over here was one of those philosophers who believed that matter was infinitely divisible. You could chop it up ad infinitum. This is called the continuum theory of matter. It's a continuum. There's no discreteness to uh, matter. That was his view of the uh, structure of matter. But there was a minority opinion, an opinion actually held by Democritus, who was 100 years older than uh, Aristotle. And Democritus believed that atom, that uh, matter was composed of discrete particles, discrete particles called, in Greek, atomos. A, meaning not, tamos, meaning divisible, not divisible particles. Well, for whatever reason, Aristotle's continuum theory of matter prevailed all the way up to the uh, 17th century. And here he is, de depicted by Raphael on the walls, uh, the frescoes on the walls in the Vatican, holding court on the continuum theory of matter. But at the same time that Raphael actually uh, painted this uh, picture, there were beginning to accumulate some observations about how matter behaved and how it reacted that didn't quite jive with this continuum theory of matter. And what were those observations? Well, one of those observations was by this gentleman, Robert Boyle. Guess what his uh, profession was? Chemist? Good guess, but he was actually a theologian as most chemists were at that time. You know him uh, largely for the empirical observation that if you take the pressure times the volume of a gas, it's always a constant, at least the, when the temperature is constant. But Robert Boyle also put forth the, probably the first idea of an element. And he called elements certain primitive unmingled bodies. And he also put forth the idea that these unmingled bodies were the ingredients of perfectly mixed bodies. It's a pseudonym for molecules, for compounds. And then there's the work of this gentleman, Joseph Priestley. Guess what his occupation was? Yeah. <laughs> right, he was a priest. And what he did is uh, he carried out some reactions of deflogisticated air with various materials. 
And what he found is that materials reacted more vigorously in deflogisticated air than they did in undeflogisticated air. Okay, and of course, deflogisticated air is nothing other than oxygen. It's the air with the nitrogen removed from it. But it really took this gentleman, Lavoisier, it really took him to understand what Priestley's experiments were all about. And what Lavoisier realized is that when materials were reacting with this deflogisticated air, that this deflogisticated air was kind of adding to the material. And he came to that conclusion because he did some very careful measurements of the mass of the deflogisticated air plus the material before the reaction and some careful measurements after and found that they were indeed equal. There was a conservation of mass. And from that, Lavoisier was really the first person to realize that a chemical reaction was analogous to an algebraic equation. He also went on to isolate 17 different metals and identified them as elements, and nine different nonmetals identified them as elements. But for all of his efforts, well, we all know what happened to him. <laughs> um, he was an advisor to the French monarchy. The judge at uh, his trial proclaimed the Republic has no use for savants. Lagrange, who was a mathematician at that time, said it took but a moment to cut off that head, though 100 years will be required to produce another like it. Well, all right, so here we have some observations. This, um, you know, we have, uh, oh, and then, oh, I forgot one other person here, and that's uh, this guy, J.L. Proust. J.L. Proust was also a, a French uh, scientist uh, at that time, but he was a little more politically savvy, and so he hightailed it out of France, and lived a long and productive life as a professor in Madrid. And what he did is that he did experiments and recognized from the results that when two elements combined to form a given compound, they always did so in definite proportions by weight, regardless of what kind of method of preparation he used to make that particular compound. All right, so here's an example where matter didn't quite behave as a continuum. There was a, a discreteness of some sense to uh, matter. 